I grew up in Wisconsin, and in the late 1960s, birds were falling out of the trees, dying. And I went to Dad, and I said, why? And he gave me Rachel Carson's Silent Spring to read. And at 13, I read that book, and I decided that I wanted to become a marine biologist like Rachel Carson and write books that explain things so ordinary people like my dad could understand them and then work to make a difference. So I went to the East Coast and did schooling, 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 got my undergraduate, my master's, and then hopped to the West Coast, Seattle, got my doctorate, and it all was in oil pollution. And I hadn't planned that, but that's just the way it was. Dispersants, um, just different aspects of using oil and trying to clean up messes. And then finally in 1985, I finished, and I didn't really have a plan. And I looked north and I went, you know, I've always wanted to go to Alaska. So I thought, I'll just take a summer off. That was 1985, and what's a marine biologist supposed to do? I became crew on a salmon fishing boat out of Cordova, Alaska and completely fell in love with the lifestyle, with the people, with the community, and decided that I'm staying, whatever it takes. And the name of the game in town was commercial fishing. So the next year I bought a boat and a permit and actually began salmon drift gillnet fishing in the big wide ocean, and it was just incredible. Commercial fishing was just so far out of anything I had ever even thought about. I mean, I came from a very academic background, 13 years of schooling. And suddenly, here I am operating a 27-foot bow picker with a diesel engine. I mean, I had to learn mechanics. I had to learn when you push this button, this is what happens when the boat makes this sound quick. you got to deal with something before you have no power. Um, and it was just such a hands-on, immediate experience of, like, literally, we could, you could die any second on that boat if you weren't tuned in to what was going on around you. And that's just not the academic world at all. I mean, you could drift off for hours in a reverie on theories, and, you know, the world, will, you'll still be in your chair when you come back. And on a commercial fishing boat, you have to be present every moment. It was like flying by the seat of my pants, making decisions that could be worth thousands of dollars, or in one case, or your life in another case, if you made the wrong decision. And I really thought my first book was going to be about that. Um, and then five years later, well, four years later, um, we had the Exxon Valdez oil spill happen in our backyard, Prince William Sound, which is where we fish. It sits stranded like a giant wounded animal all through the morning, bleeding its cargo of North Slope crude at a rate of 20,000 barrels an hour. By this afternoon, the Exxon Valdez had leaked 265,000 barrels of oil into the waters of Prince William Sound. At more than 11 million gallons, it's the largest spill in the 10-year history of the pipeline system. And I remember standing in Valdez, just looking at the mountains and thinking, I know enough to make a difference. Do I care enough? And I had to think a long time about that. And when I finally decided yes, um, I realized that this was going to be a lifetime commitment. It was not just going to be for the summer. The fishermen asked me to fly over Prince William Sound and report back to them when we first heard that there was a tanker aground. We actually heard the big one had happened. So I flew over, and it was unbelievable scene. It was just surreal. It was flat calm. It was a gorgeous March morning, a pink sunrise, pink reflected on this beautiful mountains on the snow. And here was this red tanker inside this bluish black ink stain on the surface of Prince William Sound. And there was no response equipment, no cleanup equipment. And it doesn't stay flat calm for very long, which is what I reported back to the fishermen. We need to get on this. And in three days, a storm had come up. And ultimately, the oil traveled about 1,500 miles away from the point of original impact, oiling up about 3,000 miles of coastline. If this had happened on the East Coast, it would have gone from New York Harbor to Cape Canaveral, just to give some scale. Uh, and this is just, I mean, people woke up with their beaches literally under three feet of oil. And it wasn't until 1992 and 1993 that our fisheries collapsed in Prince William Sound. In Cordova, half the people are directly engaged in the commercial fishing industry as commercial fishers. The town is just heart and soul engaged in commercial fishing. And suddenly, the heart and soul, the guts were just torn out of the community. The fishermen had been suspecting that this would happen. We were worried that the fish that were babies in 1989, that were eggs, that were embryos, and were oiled. We were worried that when they grew up as adults, if they survived, they might have trouble reproducing. And that is exactly what happened. We did a blockade of Valdez Narrows to get the attention of the scientific community and the political community. 
held up oil traffic for three days. That, in fact, did get everyone's attention. That was 25 percent of the U.S. domestic oil at the time. And what we were demanding was that scientists get their act together and explain to us what's wrong with Prince William Sound. What is wrong with Prince William Sound? We were so tired of scientists saying, well, the oil did this to sea otters, the oil did this to the birds, but there was no comprehensive connect the dots picture. And we were seeing a sick sound. That triggered two things. And each of those two things ultimately became subjects of books of mine. One was what did happen to Prince William Sound. And the scientific community determined after four ecosystem studies conducted over eight years that looking at multiple generations of mammals, birds, fish, looking at food chain interactions, that oil is much more toxic than we thought in the 1970s when we did our Clean Air Act and our Clean Water Act. Love Canal, Bhopal, Chernobyl, Exxon Valdez, this is toxic contaminants, this is chemical problems, this is nuclear, but always the result was the same. Communities of people just emotionally and mentally adrift, and no amount of trauma mitigation would bring them back together again. We thought that the worst thing that could happen to us was the spill and killing the physical environment in Prince William Sound and killing off our fisheries. But we have learned since 1989 that really the worst thing that happened was tearing apart our community, the mental health effects on our community. And this wasn't just with the spill, it was with the cleanup effects, with the money coming into town, the very divisive atmosphere, but it was also with the litigation, which we are still at this point, um, in 2007 right now, we are still appealing, litigating, fighting. This has been 18 years. And there can be no closure to an emotional trauma when there is this much upheaval still being generated. When Exxon Valdez happened, the sociologist said, let's really study this community. So Cordova became, and actually still is, a case study for man-made disasters. And what the sociologist found three years after our blockade was that peer listening circles are the trauma mitigation model. You have to get people working together again and just stopping feeling sorry for themselves and pulling themselves out of their own little misery role, back working together with people and problem solving for the common good. And what we have learned in Cordova, then, we can actually help not only our nation as there's these sporadic disasters, but also apply these lessons to the whole world. And that's the, that's the message that I'm trying to bring out in Not One Drop. And it was very evident in 1993 that Cordova had become what the sociologists call a corrosive community, polarized, intense fighting, and it destroyed an ability to do collective decision making. And once we got over that hurdle, we slowly started pockets of healing in our community. So I would say that the healing in Cordova is pretty much a mirror of the healing in Prince William Sound. It's uneven, it's slow, but it is happening. I would like to see us as a global society transition off fossil fuels before I die. And then the other angle I'd like to pursue is how did corporations get this big where their values count more than the values of ordinary people and ordinary communities? We've got to rebalance power and we've got to give power back to the people and make people's values count, community values count. And so I'd like to work on, on those two things and I figure that'll keep me busy for the next 30 years.